All right, guys, we're back. It's Bad Movies Rule. I'm your host, James House. We got a full house here today, guys. I'm in with Clint Bush is back again. We got Bob Hauser and we got Mel Vandy joining us finally in person. We don't get a Vandy's rant because we're going to get one here in person today. Ten minutes of listening to this podcast and they're going to level this town. Let's go, Suburban Commando. How's it going, guys? Pretty average. And yourself? <laughs> I'm, I'm great because we get to talk about one of my, well... One of the ten-year-old version of me's favorite movie of all time. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I watched this movie when it was new-ish. Uh, I did not see it in theaters like you guys probably did. I yeah. did watch it off of a VHS we rented from a local store in Antioch. Okay, and uh, I didn't realize how much I must have loved this movie because right before every scene happened, I knew exactly what was going on <laughs> and the the words that were going to be said. It was amazing. It was etched into your brain. Yes, loved it. Well, here's the look at the movie vitals real quick and get those out of the way, and then we'll get into just your general overall impressions of the movie. This movie was directed by Burt Kennedy. It's actually his last film. He had, uh, If you haven't heard of him, he did a lot of these B-Westerns back in the day. Uh, it was written by Frank Capello, who it was his first script, and we're actually going to get a chance to talk to Frank later in this episode, so stay tuned for that. We're excited to hear from the writer, uh, our first guest on Bad Movies Rule. Uh, movie starred Hulk Hogan, Christopher Lloyd, Shelley Duvall, and The Undertaker, basically. <laughs> and uh, this was essentially Hogan's first big movie after No Holds Barred, where he basically played himself, a wrestler. All right, so what are your overall impressions of the movie? Mel, is this your first time ever seeing Suburban Commando? Uh, I remember seeing this at a ripe young age of 41. <laughs> and let me tell you, uh, I regret watching every minute of it. No, no. Not a fan? Not a fan. What was it about it that you didn't like? <sighs> Pretty much most of it. From the part where it started and then up until it ended? No, no, that would just be <laughs> cruel. <laughs> no, you know, it, it had some good redeeming qualities and stuff, but uh, okay. overall, I just uh, I didn't get into it. Sure. Now, Bob, I know you love this movie. Yep, that is correct. Yeah, I do love I, this movie. We grew up in the same house, so I know Yes, I have some dirt on you. I know how many times you've watched <laughs> Suburban Commando. I think I watched it every day for like a year after school. I'm not going to lie. Yes, yes, that's, that's probably the worn-out VHS that Clint uh, rented. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did Be you rent it from Video Empire? Because that's Be where it kind, came from. Rewind. It's no, the only uh, copy that exists. E &E in the Housers were never kind to rewind. <laughs> let's, let's be honest. Get this back the, when I'm done with it. Yeah. It's probably the only <laughs> copy that exists in, in Illinois. No, probably that's probably accurate. That's probably accurate, Mel. I, here's what I'll say about the movie, oh, just in an overall sense. I think it's totally watchable. I think that's... I've I, seen worse movies. Yeah, I can't say, obviously, I don't enjoy it as much as my 10-year-old self did, but I still think it's an eminently watchable movie just based solely on the strength of its supporting cast. This movie, what business did it have having Christopher Lloyd, Shelley Duvall, Larry Miller, all these incredible supporting people in it? I think without those people... It's, it's much, much worse. But those guys are so good. I think that's what makes it watchable. Yeah, I mean, this was such a great movie all the way across. Just uh, I don't know if it's the memory of. Again, we, we're going to get into this, and Jay obviously is playing the part of our fathers who hated this movie when it was out <laughs> um, because he watched it at the same age for a first time. So I don't know if it's because I'm remembering being a kid, loving watching this thing, that I still loved it. But my daughter is 16. Mm -hmm. My wife was there as well, and they both fled the room um, <laughs> and only came back for short periods of time while it was playing. So I, you know. It didn't pass the Caitlin test. It did not. Oh, that's unfortunate. Because the last Very couple that you watched. Jew. If Chris did, Hemsworth right? was in the movie, it would pass the Caitlin test. Well, that's the 2021 remake version. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> So I, here's a, here's the weird thing about this movie. I I am I'm fully convinced, and we're going to ask Frank this later, that this was an Arnold Schwarzenegger vehicle. Well, that I they I just couldn't this, get Arnold for. Yeah, I look at this, and I saw that as well at the same time. And I didn't know if you had done this kind of deliberately because last week's movie as well had touched on the fact that it was potentially written for Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, right? And twins happened instead, <laughs> and this thing the same way. But yeah. you know, I'm going to jump forward and say, you know a box office failure for this movie. Um, it Sorry. did not make as much money as it cost to make. So that's terrible news always. Right. I think again, touching back on our previous two episodes, who is on the poster brings people in, right? This is bringing in kids and dads who like to watch wrestling with their kids. Not so much 
the moms and the rest of the family. Yeah, because this was right kind of at the tail end. I mean, at the tail end, this is, before, I'd say, before the end of Hulkamania. I'd say Hulkamania was still running yeah, wild we at the time that this movie came out. So I think, yeah, it drew in tens, tons of 10-year-olds. Tens. That's, yeah, that's hard. Tens of 10-year-olds. <laughs> yes. yes. That's hard to say. Yeah, okay, so tens of people flock to the theater. Tens of tons. Apparently, yeah. No, I, I hear you. I think the I think the weird thing about this movie there's if you watch it guys there's actually like sixty minutes it's ninety minutes long but there's only sixty minutes of plot like they only had enough plot for an hour and so the rest of it they just filled with like these little vignettes of Hulk just walking around doing random Absolutely. things that had nothing to do honestly with the story. I could have watched ninety minutes of just those I loved all of I'm yes. not criticizing them I think I love every single one of those stupid vignettes but it was obvious that they had to pad the movie out because they only had. I mean, about fifty minutes in is when I the plot the picks mimes. up. I love the mimes. I love the launching cats and <laughs> you know, small children. I wonder if that's. Tree. I wonder if that's just the Hulk's week, and they just kind of filmed it as he was going. No, that's possible. That's possible. He was know, just walking around, and that happens, right? What do you do when you're Hulk Hogan? You walk around doing cool stuff, right? I right. guess saving cats and rescuing mimes from K seven force fields. Yeah, and and exploding cantaloupes in old ladies' faces. <laughs> <laughs> you know, usually you have to seek that stuff out on the internet. Yeah, usually. So, Mel, what about, how do you feel about the time period? Was 1991 realistically depicted in this movie? Absolutely. Ford Festiva. <laughs> yes. I, you know, okay, I, I got to say, they got a couple things right. Uh, yeah. The 90s kind of sucked. <laughs> the movie kind of sucked. Yeah. You know, it it, it, it all, it, it all kind of made sense. It was a definite timepiece. I hear you. Now, what about the soundtrack? Oh, Boy, let me say, you know, <laughs> it's it's too bad they couldn't get like Bell Biv DeVoe in there. They had to go with, uh, uh, unfortunately, they had Hulk Hogan kind of going, you know, uh, the, the suburbs is a nice place to visit. Yeah. Uh, and then well, whatever Hogan's that was it. part, yeah. Yeah. But I wouldn't, or he said, but I wouldn't want to live there or whatever. Yeah. Or I wouldn't want to visit, brother. You don't think Hogan's got, got bars? He can't spit a little bit? Oh, he probably can. It's just whoever came up with the music <laughs> on that just kind of crapped the bed. Bob, every time I see Hogan's outfit in the, at the end of the movie, I think of Dad. The Zumbas and the blue long sleeve T shirt. Do you, mm. you remember that? Oh, yeah. He was rocking at the end. Yes. That was about that was when I saw that I go, Okay, this is nineteen ninety one in yeah. full effect right here. Absolutely. Absolutely. That was a Jack Hauser outfit <laughs> to the core. <laughs> the things that, that are a little cringy now is like to me as far as like the nineties era is when he Gives the kid the skateboard at the end. He's like, oh, cowabunga, dude. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, man, how about a bomb pop? Yeah, right. It's just like. Now we've got the mustaches, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I Mel, is, Mel is rocking a Hulk Hogan stash today. I don't know. Did you do this in honor of Suburban Commando? Uh, you know, nine months in the making, I've been planning for this. and. <laughs> and... <laughs> well, here's what I'll say about the film, and then we'll, we'll go through the um, – We'll go through, hit some of the beats in the movie. I, I think the movie is clearly derivative, right, of other things that, other better things that came before it. But, you know, they're referencing, just in the first five minutes, there's the opening Star Wars shot. I mean, direct ripoff of Star Wars. Sure. Um, they're referencing aliens in the first two minutes, right? How about a bug hunt with aliens that bleed acid, right? And then you're just like, it's reminding you of movies that you'd rather watch. I mean, like almost, right? Yeah, some of a little of that. And I think... But I think derivative could be cool, like in like a meta deconstruction of the genre. If they had, you know, sometimes movies will will rip off and mention those things as a way to deconstruct that genre and take some fun shots at it. But that's not that's not really what happened here. I think it was a missed opportunity. I think it could too be a possibility that they were trying to. I mean, leading the way in movies like uh, you know you've seen the scary movies and stuff like that, where they kind of just go completely. Um, make fun of that stuff that's before. So you'll have plots of five or six different types of the same similar. Right. And they end up just kind of making fun of the whole thing. And they just didn't uh, jump on it full bore, almost like multiple different people were writing different sections of this movie right. and putting them together. And then another, th another reference I saw, did you guys spot the Ghostbusters? Uh, was it the EKG yes, meter absolutely. or whatever? They oh yeah. That's what they were using. That's where they could find the energy from uh, yep. the weapons. And I, I thought it was like almost direct cutoff. <laughs> I wanted to go back and watch Ghostbusters again just to take the screen grabs, but I didn't. Yeah. The well, PKE that, meter. The PKE meter. Thank yes. you. Yeah, I just lost some nerd cred. Uh, the PK EKG is a heart thing. Uh, yes. The PKE meter. 
that wasn't just like something they built that was close to. I think that was the PKE meter. They just directly, I don't know, did they have it in a warehouse at the studio or something? And they just. Yeah. Well, a lot of those props it. are just borrowed from film to film, especially when the production companies own everything. So. But did they just, how did they not think someone wasn't going to realize? I mean, it's such a recognizable gadget. Maybe they thought nobody would see the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, they thought no one was going to watch this. They were this. right on down <laughs> the alley with that one. All right, well, let's get let's get into the movie. Uh, let's talk about the opening rescue scene where we're introduced to Shep Ramsey, Hulk Hogan's character, when he goes to rescue President Nakatomi so or whatever. That, I mean, guy had like a Japanese name, but it was like this white dude with gray hair. And how do you th- how do you think that opening scene, Bob? We'll, we'll go with you first. W- what did you think of that opening scene as far as how it introduced the character? It was perfect. It was a good build up. Introduced, you established the villain. Yeah, really well. And then the uh, alarm goes off, and the guys are like, intruder, level five. And he just close up, Ramsey. And then the music picks up, and you just see the footsteps. And Yeah, it's great. Him blasting bad guys all across the, you know, ship. Here's what I'll say about Hogan. He's not subtle. Subtle. <laughs> or graceful. Like, he he doesn't have, like, great fluidity to his, to his mm-hmm. movements, but he's like a... He's like a uh, just an unstoppable force, yeah. it seems. And I thought it was cool. I mean, uh, what would you guys think? I I thought the lizard hand coming through the guy's stump was actually pretty cool. Yeah, where he turns into, like, he's actually an alien in this skin. Yeah. And then once you actually damage him, he shows his actual alien form. And that was all, cool. Yeah. It Although, made you made you want to see more. Like, oh, all right, so we're building to something here. I did think I did laugh out loud when he when <laughs> after he throws the. I was at a razor envelope or what is that? It looked like a mailing envelope that was like. You ever got a paper cut before? <laughs> <laughs> that I mean, was a on. nasty paper cut. Well, but then right after that, Shep's like, "President, run!" And then two seconds later, he's like, "All right, I'm out." <laughs> and he just he Bye just now. dips on him. Didn't try very hard to save the president. I felt like. He must have been a Democrat. Maybe. Maybe that's what it was. Some partisan politics at play here in the first scene. Potentially. Is there a whole Absolutely. subtext we mix we missed? Yeah, you didn't hear him talking about intergalactic taxation and oh, that was if they had left those <laughs> scenes in, the whole thing would have made more sense. I mean, taxation is theft, right? I mean, I, I think so. I I will say I don't know who the actor is, but after Shep is in the escape pod or whatever, the most like chillest hologram dude in the history of space hologram guys go on vacation man i don't know who that actor was he was so good and he was just have you ever seen a guy that plays the space hologram dude ordering you around be so chill he's just like hey man just like go take some time off bro it's all good i was like who is this guy i love i want that guy as a boss because (laughs) that well that's the thing i i didn't understand was uh was shep in trouble You know, is he being ordered to go take a vacation? You know, like, you need to calm down. You've done way (laughs) too much saving the galaxy lately (laughs) that you need to go and just chill somewhere and charge at, like, you know, 0.1%. Right. It's going to take you some I believe the actor's name is Roy Dotras. Okay. A British actor. Which explains why he was so mellow and chill. Sure. Yeah. He was awesome. That That was was amped up. That was amped up for him, actually. That was amped up. That was Burt Kennedy, the uh, director, going, Come on, come on. We got to get the energy up for this scene. He's like, Man, my energy. Do you really think Burt Kennedy actually gave a about this movie? I I don't think Burt Kennedy cared about this movie. Uh, Because I looked at his filmography last night. I'm like, Why did this guy do Suburban Commando? Again, maybe like Shep, he was in trouble. (laughs) You know what I mean, Mel? Like, you look at the biography, it's westerns, it's cigars and beer. And And it had been a while since he'd done anything, right? Like, wasn't there a big Uh, gap in the 80s? There was a big gap. And then it's like all these, you know. Well, was he there or did he just kind of phone it in? I don't know. Maybe he had like an AD running everything or something. I don't know. know. He could have. Something that was in that cigar. All right, so so Hogan gets Hogan gets to I'm just gonna call him Hogan instead of Ramsey. Hogan gets to Earth, and we're introduced to bar none. The best part about this movie, Christopher Lloyd, is immediately likable and incredible. In the first scene you see him in, where he's basically getting choked out by his wife being made to go ask for a promotion, I thought he was great in this. Absolutely, yes. I, I've got nothing bad to say about Christopher Lloyd. He makes the movie. He's hands a pro. He, ma- he makes the movie hands down. He's an absolute pro. I would take Christopher Lloyd over Danny DeVito. 
And Christopher Lloyd's in the height of his powers at this point. He had just, the year before in 1990, did Back to the Future 3. So he's just the wrapped up. The best Western I have ever seen, personally. Back to the Future 3. It's one like of my favorites. Duck. <laughs> they, uh, they just have wrapped up the Back to the Future trilogy, and this was his next movie after doing that. So he's at the height of his powers, and I thought he was great. And then he goes in to meet with his boss, who, do you guys... Have you guys seen a lot of Larry Miller movies? The, he plays. He basically plays the same sleazeball character. Absolutely, it's and just him. It's I mean. just playing himself. But I don't care. I can't get enough of the guy. Every time, he's awesome. And if you ever want a sleazeball boss, or 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 white rich guy in your mm. movie, you could do way worse than picking up the phone and calling Larry Miller. Absolutely, you should just call Mary Larry Miller anytime. Honestly, all of his characters should just be named Larry Miller too. <laughs> <laughs> right, like I mean, he's great. Or T W O. He he puts out the he puts out the blueprints, and he's basically like they're adequate. Adequate. I, mean, yes, I spent absolutely. the entire weekend on them. I spent the entire weekend on the Incredible Blonde. Yeah, <laughs> he's awesome. All right. Anything else on 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 that opening scene? Or I I've been waiting to talk about this. Go for it. Go for it. Hit us with it. When the first time when Hulk comes out from from hiding his spaceship and he's walking down the street, right? That scene where yes, we, everybody sees him. Everybody the, sees him. In his the awesome Indians, the, that Indian store owner. Hey, what are you doing, huh? What are he's, you doing here? All Hulk is doing is walking down the street. He's not yeah. doing anything menacing. And the, that guy freaks out. He's got his broom. He's like, what are you doing? What the hell are you doing? Right? Yeah. I'm like, what is wrong with <laughs> this guy? He's freaking out. What, just because he's tall? And dressed mm-hmm. ridiculously. Mel, do you de- do you detect any type of racism in that scene? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, the Indian store owner was being racist because, or that the store maybe owner just in was like Indian. a tall, tall because Shep was orange, or probably just had a thing against orange, orange tan. I mean, he didn't say orange man bad, so I mean, <laughs> Hulk Hogan was the original orange man, uh, yeah, before Trump. I feel like. <laughs> Just go back and watch some of Hogan's matches from the 80s. He was 100% orange. What if we recast Trump as Ramsey? Oh, that's a different movie. This would be great also. I, think <laughs> I have a feeling. So he walks down the street, and he sees this dog you know, locked in the car and ends up swapping him out. This dude, and then he takes his clothes, right? Now, if right. you look around, it's a pickup truck, it, so there's not like a big cabin, and there's no other like place for him to go. Did he strip that guy naked on the sidewalk? <laughs> I, I mean, you would think so. It's California. Yes, it, this is. It would have been an eye in the nineties. People would just walk by. It <laughs> was. It was less odd than a tall man in a what? metal costume walking down the road. My question is, where did his commando outfit go? Well, actually, it was in the uh, duffel bag spaceship. Later, the duffel bag never sized up. Because he was already same. carrying the. Duffel he was already bag. carrying the duffel bag. Maybe it's some sort of alien technology that. They just don't I just talk to know. us about it. I just want to know. Maybe it's the uh, enchantment outfit. of undetectable extension like Hermione had. You have All no right. idea. I just got to say, when he was walking down the street, his cop piece could have been a little bit bigger. <laughs> steroids. The, the space cup. That <laughs> that was steroids. The space cup that looked like a bunch cup. of... Uh, you know, I got to talk about that suit for one minute. Yeah, go for it. So in the opening scenes, he gets hit like 50, 60 times. Nothing happens at all. That thing could take two more direct shots. <laughs> <laughs> Only two more direct shots later. But yet he's concerned right. that they have a weapon pointed at him at the end of that first scene. That's true. And, and as he just walks through a barrage of photon, laser, Well, maybe whatever. that was the one guy who was able to shoot not the suit. You know, all that exposed Hulk Hogan. I mean, the cod piece wasn't that big. They they weren't exactly like you know. I don't know how protective the suit was. There was lots of lots of space in between those yes, pieces. Absolutely, there was a lot of bad guys with mullets in that movie. Like, let's just hope he shoots me in this diamond area on my chest, <laughs> and otherwise I'm hosed. But he's a special guy. So I mean, look, he was able to find an apartment with a sign that just said apartment and an arrow. Where That's was the true. address? <laughs> well, he kind where of was the address? That way. I was I was expecting. Was there just a bunch of arrows down the street? Probably. <laughs> Just pointed to Shelley Duvall's house. Yeah, well, where was the I address? Imagine that place. That was that. That would be a great time. He to just be shows alive. up at the front door with the crumpled up flyer. We're here to rent the I'm apartment. Here to rent the apartment. Okay. I don't have any money, brother. 
Good lord. But I, I have think, a mustache. I think him and Shelly Duvall worked something out there. Oh, he they definitely probably did. He, did. he didn't have any earth. Obviously, mind. Christopher Lloyd was cutting her off. I mean, right. Yeah, he comes home, and she's all, you know, like, you know, you had a bad day. Let's yeah. take care of this. And he's like, I just don't have the energy right now. Man card gone. Sorry. That no, is you know what? Your I think biggest he had, failure. Yeah. I think he had a Marty waiting in the shed <laughs> that nobody, that we didn't see or know about. He wow. turned down his wife so that, if I get this right, so that he could go beat things with a hammer? Yes. Absolutely. Not relatable to me. Well, I mean, maybe he didn't, didn't exactly. Have, maybe uh, he didn't have a hammer. Oh, well, okay. Weird. Uh, yeah, and I don't and I don't know about you guys, because Shelly Duvall will always be like uh, Rock and Rhyme, Miss, you know, Mother Goose. Did you ever see Rock and Rhyme, Mother Goose back in 1990? She played Little Bo Peep. It was like this kid. She didn't movie. try for the MILF status there? No. I Shelly Duvall trying to be sexy it was just really weird to me. I don't know. You know, it w- it probably would have worked in The Shining. It may have <laughs> kind of turned the entire film there. Maybe he wouldn't have been so angry. Right. <laughs> Could have saved the whole family. Okay. Well, Charlie <laughs> is not thrilled that Shep has come to live at their house. So, of course, what does he do? He snoops into all of his stuff and chases after him. Now, th- at this point, they've done they've gone to great lengths to show how he's not a risk taker. Right, right. He won't even right drive through then. the right drive through the light, but he'll he'll f- pull the trigger on an unidentified laser pistol of some type. Right. of some type. After basically burglarizing <laughs> his uh, tenant, right, and also then just like go full like detective mode and follow this guy to wherever who knows what he's doing. Right. Did we forget that he actually lit a car on fire? So he's now an arsonist. He is, but. But here's the good thing about him shooting that gun off is that we are now treated to pre-Undertaker Mark Calloway coming into the game to yeah. chase after Hulk. That was really cool to see Undertaker, pre-Undertaker, show up in this movie. That was really cool. He just crumples the letter. Yeah. You know, crum- not the letter, I apologize. Crumples the, uh, the, wanted poster. the wanted poster and does that Undertaker look and just walks away with... Again, uh, you say it's the Undertaker look. I think it's just... His look. It's just yeah, he just says resting, kill you face. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he wakes up in the morning, pull, you know, yeah. Yeah. I'm going I'm to kill this bowl of porridge or oatmeal, whatever he does in Texas. Go. Captain Crunch. Captain Crunch. Obviously. All right, can we take a minute and talk about some of these vignettes? Because that's right about the time the movie just takes a half an hour detour to follow Hulk around doing stupid stuff. What were some of your guys' favorite ones? I, I'll say that the way the whole thing gets kicked off kills me every time where, where the wife is screaming in the living room you know, screaming yeah. to release her energy or whatever. And he tackles her behind the couch. But then when the mailman yes. <laughs> knocks on the door, he pulls out this like gigantic Bowie knife. Get down. Uh, just the Hulk's he delivery. He grabs the guy's moment. hand through the <laughs> mail slot. I mean, who sticks their entire hand through the mail slot to put yeah. mail inside? Too? Yeah, I'll that tell was you. Hilarious. That was a unskilled mailman. <laughs> you don't realize the danger he was in at that point because that was at the peak of the uh, mailman shootings. Right. They were all well Yeah, armed. they were going postal, right? Yes. All over the place. He should have yes. known better to mess them with, a, with a mailman. Um, How about the kid that makes the... So this <laughs> this had me, too. This kid makes a joke about how his mother can skate better yeah. than Hogan, and Hogan literally hulks out like he would do in a wrestling match. He gave him... He looked at the kid like he was Macho Man Randy Savage, <laughs> and it's like the two ways Hulk knows how to act, right? And, right. And he just went in to it and i'm like oh no he's gonna put the leg drop on this kid three punches boot and a leg drop <laughs> <laughs> honestly uh, the look he just looks up and gives him was terrifying imagine that as an eight-year-old having hulk hogan look like he's gonna eat you for dinner amazing it was awesome i have chills <laughs> one of my favorite vignettes is when he whips the newspaper roll at the kid yes because we all have a kid in our neighborhood <laughs> that we just want to throw someone bullseye. <laughs> bullseye smart ass them into a wall or something <laughs> that is one of my favorite scenes i don't know just because you're just we all we can all relate we're all fathers we all played that video game yeah, yeah. we're all like there's just one kid in the neighborhood you just want to just throw a newspaper roll at you know and how <laughs> satisfying it is to <laughs> yeah. hit the customer with the newspaper yeah. well that and break their windows break their windows <laughs> knock their mailboxes over kill their flowers yeah bullseye smart ass yeah, and why is there a mime in a dark alley? That's where mimes well, live. I mean, there's like garbage and dumpsters behind, and he's he just, wasn't good night. enough to mime under a streetlight. He was <laughs> learning how. He's working his way up. Yes, that was the most random. I mean, the bits were funny, 
But I, I just was like, why is, why is this here? He was why probably an aspiring actor. I mean, they are talking <laughs> South, Southern California here, right? It's true. Yeah. I mean, he was kicked out of all the good miming places by good mimes. Yeah. I think, I think Hulk's best acting, which is a low bar, I'll be honest, came in the video game scene where he takes over oh, absolutely. Afterburner for the kid. What game? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little fly comes out surrendering. First of all, I love how they're just, it's afterburner, right? It's clearly yeah. afterburner to anybody who's ever played the game, but they're talking about like it's this like space commando. I, I love that when you win the game, the console just smashes into pieces and as Waves Bob white flag. says, the white flag. Yeah. Like, no, we're done. Like, okay, right. who's pumping a quarter into this and playing right. it again? How about the car alarm? Impossible. I thought yes. only Zenites <laughs> could do that. <laughs> the uh, car alarm was amazing. That uh, was good. That was so good. <laughs> no, take the car. <laughs> Wait, let's talk about this. Wait, let's talk about this. You can oh. stand, you can as, stand close as close as you want. As you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. No, please. Yeah, that was good. Lord, I've fallen and I can't get up. I, I think I liked it right up to that point because as soon as they, that was another like, oh, yeah, 1991, they had to do the I've fallen, fallen and, and I, I can't, can't get up, up joke. But I think after, that you're only upset about that now. You probably enjoyed it back in the day. Oh, sure. You're only upset about it now because it's so much closer to being applicable to your daily life. Yeah, right. Exactly. I'm I'm getting closer and closer to life alert age, and now I'm starting to resent it. Yes, yeah. starting to get the AARP cards in the mail. So. Yeah, honestly, it's ridiculous. Well, this is this is the crazy thing about this movie, guys. Fifty minutes in at this point, before what I would say the buddy comedy comes together, right? Where right. where Shep and Charlie are actually working together, and that's I think when it actually gets good because Christopher Lloyd is great at that, right? Right. And so they had to kill all this time. And then the last 40 minutes, they're actually off doing the adventure. And I thought that's when the movie got really, really good. Oh, I mean, that's just character development. Yeah. Character <laughs> development. Yeah. Good job there, Mel. Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say I thought the joke when he shows, so the, when he finally shows up to get Charlie and she's in the secretary, who I thought was really good in this movie. The secretary was good. Says, take a seat. And Hogan walks back over with, with the bench. The, with the bench. <laughs> I legitimately laughed out loud. I thought that was a fantastic joke. And then Larry Miller comes out without skipping a beat. Oh, it's here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good each and You like it? We'll get rid of it. Yeah. What would you guys think about the bank scene where they find those guys with the freeze Frozen, gun? Frozen. The freeze yeah. gun. I wish I had a freeze gun and a bank that had that much money in it. Yeah. I mean, that's what I think of that scene. Is like that would solve a lot of problems in my daily life. I thought the bank scene is a winner. I thought that was a good scene. I think all their action sequences in this movie are good, and to you know, for the most part. Yeah, and for the most part, most of the extras did a good job of it, being frozen. A couple of them it, were a little wobbly. It almost seems as though like the action scenes were directed by somebody else who probably cost a lot more money than the people who actually directed the rest of the movie. You're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, action is sort of a genre. You got to kind of be that guy. Yeah. yeah. Why are the intergalactic bounty hunters going through the drive-thru? Inter- the, they're probably hungry. Yeah, but they it could be a shouldn't even know. If, if Shep doesn't understand what a mailman is, how are these guys supposed to come here and understand how to go through a drive-thru? How do they even know how to drive a car? Another excellent question. I well, mean, I mean, it's basically a spaceship with wheels, right? It's just a crappy spaceship. Yeah, it's a really crappy spaceship because it literally won't go into space. Bob, is that it your favorite? It goes into parking spaces. That's true. Is right. that your favorite scene in the entire movie when they go through Surfenberger? It is. It's it's hilarious because you got two out of this world ass kickers mm-hmm. going through a drive through called Surfenberger in a just married car. Yeah. So what happened to the couple that were just married? They're obviously dead. Oh, that's a good question. Did they kill some oh, absolutely. newlywed couple? Absolutely. Is that the tone? They couldn't. They couldn't. They couldn't just like put blood coming out of the trunk a little bit. Or was that PG? That's too. That's too. That's what I'm saying. Given the tone of this movie, are we sure that he didn't just leave them on the side of the road? No, no. They killed them. They arrived in a giant beetle. They killed them. Well, he may have. You don't come to planet Earth from the church. You know, that car was just empty, waiting for them to come out of the church. You don't come to this planet. You don't come to this planet in a beetle and not kill somebody for just married. I'm. I'm (laughs) That's logic that I can understand. I think. I'm willing to bet that just like in the Mummer Man movie, one of them picked it up at the gas station because the keys were in it. All right. Well, that's that's entirely. It's a great possible. scene. It's a great that's scene. Totally the surf the burger is just funny to me because it's just like it's out of left field, and they blast the drive through thing. So yeah, because right. clearly you shoot the face on the sign <laughs> when you want the noise to stop coming out of the little <laughs> right exactly squawk box. Which right. which did that scene happen before the famous? 
ice cream truck line? Or is that yeah? Exactly? Oh no, that was before that. Okay, that so was that was before that. So which that was a great prelude to that line. That's true. Where he pretty much says ten minutes listening to these ice cream trucks and you'll level this town. So then we move into the the, the what we'll call the crystal heist scene where they're going to get the crystals yes. from the ball. I thought the crystal heist scene was a winner. I thought that was another again. The last forty minutes, I thought it was great scene after great scene. I'm like this. We could have just made this movie a little bit longer. Yeah, it would have been a, incredible, and. Uh, Although I don't understand why the secretary has a gun on them up in wherever they were. Her boss is a... Uh, wow. Well, she, she already pulled the she gun She already pulled the gun in the, lo- in the office. Yeah, but why would she, They were down there in the party, and she was down there in the... Well, maybe you know, the it was, was her job when he left to protect those okay. high-value crystals. If you watched the whole time, sitting she's, out trying, on the table. She's, trying to get, she's trying to get a piece of the Hulk orange Hogan. and yellow. Yeah. Oh, so she followed him up there for a different reason. Yeah. Okay. Until she realized, oh, they're robbing the place. All right, I got to pull out my gun. And so then we get Hogan versus Undertaker one before they actually fought in the ring a year later. Right. And man, did those jet boots really do him in because both times he tried to fight, those boots were the reason why why he got, I mean, first time he got sent through the ceiling, well, multiple ceilings. Right. And then when they were <laughs> fighting on top of the rolling <laughs> cart, did anyone want to catch boots the fact got him that into. he went right up a chick's into ass? A toilet. <laughs> right through the toilet. <laughs> right through right. the toilet, up You're someone's ass. Up a stair, up a floor, up a floor, up a floor, and amazingly, no plumbing, right into a <laughs> toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but you notice there was a woman sitting on the toilet when he went up into the toilet, right? Yes, I did notice that. That was just funny to me. It is are, funny. Are we thinking number one or number two? It, it don't matter at that point because he's all up in there. <laughs> <laughs> if... What would you do if you were just like in the bathroom trying to take care of business and the flipping undertaker shoots up from underneath you well, through the toilet? I think initially you're going to be really surprised and angry and then you're going to see it's the undertaker and you're like, take whatever you want. <laughs> I'm going to question what I had for dinner last night. <laughs> <laughs> this is because of the That's tacos right. I had. That's right. <laughs> I've, I've been known to destroy a toilet or That's two. Right. <laughs> well, here... <laughs> They have the finale, so they get out of there with the crystals. They go to have the final showdown with with Suter, who I guess he was fine. The actor was fine. He only was in two scenes, and yeah, he was chewing the scenery a little bit. I don't even know what the guy's name is, but William Ball. William Ball, mm-hmm. I think, not even registering on the list of some of the other villains we've already He's talked about. He's not on the Raul Julia level no. on this podcast, but they have it, and I just love the whole concept of the finale, right? Which is basically. Have you ever squashed somebody's nuts so hard they turned into a lizard? <laughs> 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 I mean, that was the whole finale, right? Basically, yeah. <laughs> Which I love. I love that. <laughs> and, and Hogan's trying to tell him not to because he knows that <laughs> if you injure this guy for real, he's going to turn into this lizard freak version of himself right. and come after you hard. Right. And uh, that was fantastic. I thought that all, was, that all worked really well. And then a couple more vignettes from Hulk. And then the movie ends with Charlie committing a felony. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah, he does. Exploding a traffic light. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> whose idea was it? To, like, what state was this in? Is this it's in California? California. So, okay, so yeah. what, and whose right mind of the Department of Transportation thought it would be a good idea to put a street light that far away? Well, and here's Government the doesn't make sense. <laughs> the street light was in the proper place, but the white line that they all stopped It was like 200 yards back. was way back. And it was you, 200 yards back. I And we're, we're going to gloss over the fact that in both of those failed drag race scenes, it is mm-hmm. exactly the same footage both times. It just, they clipped it in. They didn't even have to film it twice it is the same cars same avoidance everything so, it is legitimately the same scene so you're saying this movie could have lost more money it could have potentially lost more money if they'd have filmed two separate drag races out of there wow but the fact that there's a ford festiva and it makes it a win for me what and then what kind of car was that that, that hulk flipped over at one point that was a that camaro was, was that, that a was camaro the, that was the rs 25th anniversary edition i believe yeah so i can't say the festiva was the best car in the movie because how dare you sir <laughs> hold on i'm gonna, I'm you gonna know what, though? did they can have I fact mullets? check this no i, I can't f- remember if the uh, guys in the camaro had mullets because that's uh oh, this is the 90s we're gonna sue you <laughs> <laughs> with the destruction of property metal language let's get it to them the best part of that little thing though is the capper at the end the guy goes, you'll be hearing from our attorney Right. A bunch of beer drinking dudes. And you're being from our attorney. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what kind of world is this? I would be saying the same thing. Like, what the? All right, guys. Well, oh, it's that time. We're going to we're gonna talk to the screenwriter. I'm excited to uh, to welcome him in. I got some um, questions for him. Yeah. Well, let's get him. Let's get him on the horn and uh, and get him going. Okay, guys, it's time to welcome in the brand new friend of the show. 
Uh, not only was he the screenwriter for this film, Suburban Commando, but he's also written other great films like Constantine, and he was a quiet man. He started off as a boy in Florida with a dream, and now he's here with us. This is Frank Capello. Frank, welcome to the show, buddy. Hey, man. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Good to be here. Yeah, so we've uh, we've been talking about Suburban Commando, a movie that... Um, me, I don't know. I can't speak for Clint and Jay, but me and my brother, I know growing up just absolutely loved this movie. And so I guess let's just start off by you telling us the story of, I mean, how did the idea for this movie come to you and what was the genesis for, for this script? Yeah. You know, that started, um, how long ago has that been? That's been 1988, 87, 88, 89. Uh, it's, I've even actually thought about this recently like where did that come from and i think one of them was uh the day the earth stood still um you know if you've seen that movie obviously everybody has uh you know flying saucer lands and they got the giant robot standing out front and they shoot the guy you know the military does so he gets injured and they take him into a house and he's living with a normal family and i always thought that was kind of cool here he was this alien from another world he's got this giant robot if you touch him he'll just melt everything and i thought well that's kind of cool so i think that was in my mind when i was doing this what if a, what if a, you know an interstellar galactic warrior kind of guy's ship broke down and he had to move in with a normal family you know what would that be like you know so i started thinking but there's always an a and a b side of stories right so naturally if you just let your mind go you say well what if this guy followed? And I even think in um, Day the Earth Stood Still, she followed him back to the ship. And I remember she had to go in there and say, Klaatu, Berko, Nico, whatever, so the robot would kill her. Yeah. But it was the same sort of thing. Okay, so what if Chef, you know, the ship and everything was damaged and all this, and uh, the Christopher Lloyd character, Charlie, uh, you know, followed him one day. And then after he left, he got into his stuff and he became a superhero. I said, well, that'd be really fun. I sent it out, and like I said, it sold that day, and it sold more probably than I had paid myself in five years wow. uh, on that day. And so it wasn't, it wasn't, it was this guy's first screenplay sale as an agent. And one, about a month later, he sold one for double. And he goes, if I only knew what I knew now, then you'd have had double. And I said, oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, so right, too late. <laughs> I, I heard Suburban Commando used to be called Urban Commando. That's how it started. And you're going to make this is a joke because you guys love the movie. And when, when I saw it, I thought, oh, my God, you know, that was I was so close to directing the film. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they'd always give you these promises. They'd say, well, if you help us get this one made, uh, you'll get the next one. And it's always the next one. So they hired Bert Kennedy, who did support your local sheriff. And the movie anyway, the movie came out the way it came out. You guys love it. I'm yeah. so glad. Uh, well, I got to direct three days on it, so that was kind of cool. Well, that's what I was going to ask you next, Frank, is, you know, you sell the script, right? And then what? how did it change, right? Because I'm assuming once it's out of your hands, it what the end result was, how far was that from what you had written and expected? Well, the, the, the 20th Century Fox bought it, mm -hmm. and uh, John Davis... Marvin Davis actually owned 20th Century Fox. That big Die Hard building that you see in the movie Die Hard is right on the 20th Century Fox lot. Right. And so when I, I you know, I was, I had four people wanting it, three or four. My, Michael Lerner, who did the movie with Matthew Broderick and uh, about the endangered species, were on a menu list. I can't remember the name of that oh, movie. Was, but, was that Project X? Uh, no, oh. it was, uh, even Marlon Brando was in the movie. They were like, uh, it was just a strange ass comedy, and okay. I remember sitting in the guy's front lawn, the front lawn of a giant twenty million dollar mansion. Beverly, you got to remember, I've never been inside of a mansion like that. Yeah. And I'm sitting out on the front lawn, and I don't know why am I not allowed in the house first, and why in the front lawn where cars are going by, and I think it's just a show off. So they had the girl coming down with drinks and everything in the front lawn, and I remember they go, "We love Suburb Irving Commando. We love this script." We just had a few changes, starting with page one. And they went through for an hour and a half and made like 100 changes. And I'm thinking, holy <laughs> this is Hollywood? But then I get a call from 20th Century Fox, and they had passed on this book. 
and I get a call from their D girl development girl. She goes, please, John Davis is going to call you. We did not pass. We did not pass. And I didn't know what happened. What it was was he picked it up mm. off a pile and read it himself and said, I want to make this movie. And I came in with, you know, Schwarzenegger and DeVito uh, as a casting choice. And that went on to help get the script sold. So the script actually went through one, one major rewrite for 20th Century Fox. Mm. And uh, again, another memory, because I saved the tape on my recording machine, answering machine back then. And it was from, I don't even want to mention the guy's name, but he was a huge producer out there. And he was a total tyrant. Uh, matter of fact, there's a movie called Swimming with the Sharks. It's really about that. Kevin Spacey's in a team. He's, he's playing this guy. Okay. So I get this message on my phone going, Hi, this is, you know, whatever his name is. And he says, this got to be the best damn rewrite I've ever seen. And so I'm on my way, right? I'm thinking, well, i got a career and all this kind of cool stuff. And I don't hear from anyone. And the script didn't get made for some reason. And I know later, Ivan Reitman stole the casting idea at Ghostbusters because he and I worked together. And uh, they basically stole the DeVito and Schwarzenegger team. And so they weren't going to do this one. So it went into what they call turnaround, meaning anyone can pick up the script within a certain amount of time and just pay the other company that paid me. So that's what happened. And so New Line Cinema picked it up, and they're the ones that did the Freddy Krueger movies and all those, you know. And they basically made it into their most expensive film they'd ever done, which was around $10 million. Frank, so I'll tell I you. I was telling you. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to cut you off, Frank. I, I was just going to say that uh, I, I honestly don't think that Schwarzenegger and DeVito would have done what they, you know, what happened in this film. So you think it's better that it ended up with, yeah, with Hogan? I, absolutely. I, I, what, did you have somebody in mind from the start? Before I even wrote the screenplay, when I was thinking about who would the guy be, because when you're writing, it's good to hear, you know, to see somebody in your head. And back then, Schwarzenegger was the guy. I mean, Terminator, I think right. it was 84. So yeah, Terminator has been out and all that. And uh, Christopher Lloyd has been in one of my favorite films, Back to the Future. Yes. Um, I mean, that came later. But uh, Danny DeVito, you know, it was their size discrepancy that made it work. One was tiny, one was big. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the idea was. And when the script went out, it went out with that on it, towards mm -hmm. your DeVito project. And so when they saw that, everybody, Ivan Reitman, didn't want to do that. So he had two writers come up with like three ideas, and one of them was twins. Mm -hmm. So they took that, and that threw our project onto the burner, so to speak. And then they finally did it later with Schwarzenegger. So I didn't know Christopher Lloyd was on. I thought, wow, it's going to be great. He's crazy. <laughs> you know, uh, Hulk Hogan would be fun. Yeah, that would be good. Hulk Hogan was uh, actually, you could understand him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was his big, his big yeah, leg. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the thing is, you see the movie through the lens of how old were you when that movie came out? So we would have been in sixth grade in 1991. Not ever. So like 10 or 11 years maybe, old. Yeah, maybe or, the yeah, first or, or second time. Six <laughs> 10 or 11, grade, yeah. 10 or 11 years old. I would be three at that time. Yeah, but, Bob was three, but every, everybody I was, else. I was, I, was old. I was maybe 10 years older than you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm there. I watched this film, and uh, I thought it was terrible. I mean, this is <laughs> just, I saw the first cut down in Tustin, and they weren't going to release the movie. Uh, as a, Let me go back, though, and say, what did it change? Because that's yeah. what you're asking. And, yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know what they were changing because I wasn't asked to be the writer. And this happens to a lot of people. You'll sell an idea. Uh, you know, it's a pretty good amount of money at the beginning. Uh, you know, it's called a spec script sale because they didn't develop it. I I just made it and they bought it. Mm -hmm. And the coverage was great. And I did rewrites. And then it went to New Line. And the New Line hired a director, and I didn't even know it. And hired another. And he had a writer friend that he had on it. So I told all this, and, and you know, I, I I came to the set one day, outdoor set, and it's the scene where the general's sitting out on his Jeep, one in his drag racers on the other, and I think I told you this the other day, and that is, I was freaking blown away because it was exactly laid out the way I had it in my head. I didn't write in the screenplay, and on the right is this, and on the left is that. It was exactly how I thought. So I said, wow, this is so awesome. They reached right into my brain, and they put exactly what I saw. 
That you general, know, so I just gotta say, I, that general was one of my favorite characters. He's uh, General Suter. Yes. No, <laughs> no, the general. No, the general on the jeep. The general on the jeep. Oh, the oh yes, the yes, he was fantastic. Colonel. Yeah, yeah. Like Colonel. I can't remember the actor's so, name, but he was. Colonel, uh, he was from uh, some of those old yeah, westerns that Burt yeah, Kennedy had done, right? Yeah. Sometimes you gotta lose to win. Well, yeah. I can even almost remember writing that. You know, it was funny because. Uh, you know, he was the everyday guy that's been beaten down. Mm-hmm. That, that's the whole idea. What is there a, a movie right now uh, with Oakenberg, the guy from uh, Better Call Saul called Nobody? Yeah. And even Breaking Bad starts out with a guy that's been beaten down. And, you know, you always want them uh, to rise up and, and be a hero. And, mm-hmm. and I smile. The guy gets to be a superhero. And it's funny, the guy down on his lawn that day went through like 100 different changes. They were taking out that. They go, well, we don't really need that part. But, and I'm thinking, that's the whole story. Yeah, oh, it's great. You take out the part. So they're pretty much the kicking you in the nuts. <laughs> I had all kinds of scenes. I had them in a movie theater uh, where Shep comes through the back door and sees something on the screen, thinks it's real. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's so, great. Anyway, uh, I had Charlie and him running across a rooftop. That's where I did all my exposition. I never do exposition when two people are standing there. They gotta be running, they gotta be, you know. I was gonna say, given that they made all these changes, and I I know you had said before that that you got a chance to direct a few scenes because they had you add some stuff back in, right? Yeah, well, what happened was, was uh, Burt Kennedy, the director, I think, uh, when I went to the set, like I said, that was a great feeling. It was Mm -hmm. a great feeling thinking, this movie's gonna be exactly what I want. But then I went again, and I went to the warehouse and the studio where they were building all the sets and all. And they had the spaceships they were building. You know, I brought my son there. I think my son was three or four years old, mm-hmm. five years old maybe at the most. And uh, I bring other friends along, too. And I, I remember that when I got on, tried to get in the studio, they go, well, who are you? And, and I said, well, I'm that My name's on the screenplay. And they go, no, it isn't. And they got this other guy's name on it. Oh, no. And I finally got the producer to let me on the lot. And I thought, this is really, and it was kind of embarrassing, too, because my son's going, Dad, I thought you wrote this, you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it is the common way they treat writers in Hollywood. Uh, oh. And playwright, you know, in theater and all, the writer is king. Right. In Hollywood, the writer is the lowest guy in the total pole. They get kicked off without even knowing it. Yeah. There's no rhyme or reason they do it. They just say, well, he must be burned out. We better get somebody else. you got to remember, on Constantine, I did 50 freaking drafts of that script. It was called Constant Pain because <laughs> I did so many drafts on it. <laughs> uh, if you're a decent writer, you can always come up with a new idea. If they don't like something, you basically don't throw it. You don't do what they tell you in the room. What you do is you listen to what they're telling you, get the idea of what they want changed. Oh, they just don't, they're bored right here. That's right. really well, what all those notes are before. Right. It's so like some of them just better. Right. It's like some of them just kind of hang out there and are like, "Hey, you know, I got this great idea. Aliens." Well, isn't it? Isn't it just where a lot of these guys just want to put their stamp on the movie in a way? Yeah, we call it. They, they piss on it. They got to put their scent. Yeah, their scent on it. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> mark their territory. They honestly, they are, and I'll swear to God, they don't really care if they ruin the story. They just know that I did that part. Right. You had said when they first screened the movie that it was unreleasable, right? So what what was wrong with it at that point that, that was getting killed by the test audiences? You know, I, I really honestly don't know. So I went down to the screen, the second screen, and it was about 30 miles from Los Angeles down south. And and it was full of, uh, you know, a big crowd that they assembled. It was all storyboards for the special effects. So mm-hmm. you got this whole opening like Star Wars, it's just a piece of paper that says ship going across the screen. <laughs> they don't even have an animatic or anything. They just have a, a card. Oh, so geez. you got a regular audience watching this. Well, first of all, that's going to really bring down the whole excitement right there. You don't feel immersed so in that? It was not very, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, well, I'm not unless I'm a novelist. <laughs> I don't <laughs> read a book. But uh, I come to watch a movie, but anyway, all these all these people were reacting to that, and and I thought it was I thought it was slow, uh, slow paced. Uh, kind of shit. Star Wars was unreleasable. If you remember the story, yeah, he showed it to all his George Lucas showed all his friends, and only Spielberg said, "Hey, you got something there." Yeah. So I looked at it. I looked at it as this is raw. I, this isn't unreleasable. This just isn't edited right yet. And it doesn't have a good score yet. And the effects aren't into it. But they, 
had put $10 million into this and were just going to cut their losses and put it straight to video in a year or two. And I don't even know if they were going to finish it, you know, with the facts and all. So I saw that and I went to New Line. I just said, hey, I wrote a bunch of scenes. They didn't even ask me for this. So I said, I put them on the table. And I said, here's what I think needs to happen. You need this, you need that. You don't have that. You need a little bit more excitement at the end with the, the guys that he's fighting. And then I came up with these ideas. You know, they have rocket boots on. They go through the roof. They go through things. They loved it. And I go, I mean, rocket boots is, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I said, uh, and my friend, which is so funny, lived down the street from me. He actually made those for the film. Like, I'm a Java. <laughs> so he was like a cool guy. He had a whole garage built props and everything. So the, uh, the thing is, is that, I wrote it, I put it in there, I said, but I'm not, I'm not selling this to you. You're not going to pay me this. And they go, no. I said, no, I'm directing you. Wow. And they go, you're going to direct this? Yeah, I'm going to direct all of this that I'm giving you. And they paused, and they had looked at my reel, and they said, oh, well, maybe you can do pickup shots. Uh, well, but there's some acting. Hulk Hogan's in this. What can you do with Hulk Hogan? Oh, my God. So uh, I, I end up getting to direct. But they wouldn't give me the action scenes. They said, no, so, so we, we're going to get Gary Davis from Terminator 1, the $100 million film like back then, yeah. which means he's going to be expensive on everything he does. And I'm thinking, why are you going to do that? And I can do it all. Well, anyway, I got three days, and I got to do all the acting with Hulk Hogan. And I remember on the set watching them make the movie, no one was paying attention to Hulk. He was up in a big bubble up there. Uh, I guess in the spaceship and, yeah. and the director's down here talking about 1972 when he did a film with Don Knotts. He's got a dog in his lap and folks up there going, what am I supposed to do? And I, I remember that like it was yesterday. And I wanted to go up there and just say, well, here it is. You're in space. What you got? You got this. And I was going to go through it, but I'm not allowed. I'm just a writer. So, uh, well, most of, yeah, I wrote most of it. What they did was they brought in a, supposedly comedy writer to give it more jokes and stuff. Yeah. And um, he, by the time failed. it got released, a lot of that got cut out. And, and I was involved in the final. I even got to go to the store and everything, which was kind of cool. So I did these three days, and mm. the three days were all these gags. They wanted a mime in it. And I go, oh, my God, I hate mime. That was the but best I get part the of the movie. I, I am a fan of mime. <laughs> even though... <laughs> Andrew Dice Clay even came out that night with the mime. And uh, I remember the AD going, listen, Andrew Dice Clay's come out, but you're not allowed to talk to him. I said, what? And he goes, yeah, he's a buddy of mine, and he's going to be in the movie. He's going to do some stuff. So I stood there by the side, the director of the movie, the writer of the movie now, and this asshole (laughs) AD, which I hate ADs. I don't have assistant directors. I always get women as assistant directors from now on. I don't want a guy that wants my job. Right. You know, that's kind of what ADs are. So uh, they, they, they like to yell action. I yell action myself. I don't ever let them do it anymore. So I'm standing there and I'm the guy's place. Well, what do you want me to do? What am I supposed to do? And, and he's going, well, maybe. And so I finally go, oh, <clears throat> what if you did this, 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 and this? And he goes, yeah, that's great. And the guy looked at me like, you weren't supposed to talk. You weren't even supposed to let him talk. <laughs> it's like, oh, I tell you, oh, Andrew, you make a good movie? Yeah. Andrew Dice oh Clay would have made was... a great mime. <laughs> oh, uh, well, no, he's not. He's always watching the mime. Yeah. He's going, hey, buddy, can I help you there? There's a door right here. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? So it would have been funny, but, uh, but mimes, you know, certain kind of movies work, I guess, yeah. and others they don't. But everything that I did, which is really, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm yeah. just saying the rest of the stuff must have really sucked because <laughs> what I shot ended up in the trailer. Yeah. Uh, the Hulk with the kids at the video arcade, another one where you had the cat and the cat gets blown up into the sky and it's skateboard. All that stuff I shot in yeah. those three days. And, uh, you know, then they're saying, God, I wish you'd have had you do the whole movie and wow. you want to punch him in the face. But <laughs> so I end up, uh, thinking, well, they're going to give me another film. They're going to give me a film. Never, never did. Got to tell you, after this was pretty funny when we were doing the, uh, the reshoots and all that. And yeah. Hulk and I kind of bonded on that because he couldn't stand up. He had such a bum knee. Mm. And the shot where he's picking up the two kids, you know, they got wires on and everything so they right. can lift them up. 
and he can't even get off the ground. And he, he would come up to me and say, Frank, I, you know, you got me leaning down here in the car or you know, whatever. I can't get up. And I said, what? He said, no, my knee is locked up. And so he used to call me, we were the Florida boys, because he's from Florida also, you yeah. know. So these are the Florida boys. And I, I remember even when the film released, right when it released, there was this whole story that steroids and wrestling no. And, and they plugged it on to they uh-uh. plugged it on to him, and that hurt the release. I remember that it really hurt the release. Yeah. So everything in that movie, other than writing it and selling it, uh, was my introduction to, to a Hollywood that, wow, this is how it works. Yeah. And I'm not again. I, I think my son could have done a better job as director on this, but uh, and he was six. So, you know, I think I could have done a better job. Right now, you'd be telling me something different. You'd be saying. Guys, one of my favorite films, and the other two guys would say, "Go do it." They're not yeah. talking. See, <laughs> you have this. You have this, and I well, have met other people like you that like this film, and I just like you had to be young. Yeah, well, and you know, because yeah, I'll say this. I'll say this, Frank, because you know we're we're, we're out of time, but I want to ask you one more question before we go, uh, and I do want to say right. before I ask you that question. Uh, that I do love this movie, and I I understand because we you know we've made we've made films before, and nothing on the level of what you've worked on, but but I I've got my own movies that I can't sit through and watch because all I see when I watch it is all the all the ways it didn't work out the way I wanted it oh, to, yeah. right? So I totally get that, but at least know there's people out here that that do love this picture. Um, what I do want to give you a chance is you know if people are listening and they want to check out what you're up to right now, what you've got what do you got going on right now that people can check out? I'm homeless. I live in a ditch and I van down by the right. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. You. Uh, That's California, uh, isn't it? That's, yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> I'm actually, it's so funny. I've come full circle. You know, doing movies uh, when I was younger, Super 8 films, you know, I'd get my buddies out. We could do something. And editing on that tiny little format was terrible. But uh, now I've, I'm back to almost doing it that same way. And I'm actually loving it. Now, that's not saying that I wouldn't mind having a, hundred man crew and uh, being able to do films like that again, but right. Hollywood changed. It changed back in 2008 or nine. My last film that I did with a full crew was back then 2007 or eight. And since then I've made two more and I started, decided to make a film every year. So last year I did one called steel wool and it was just an experiment. I had a new Sony little camera that could shoot at night. And I was going to make a movie called Blue Car, and the money was there. Again, you wait, you wait for that green light. That movie's on Amazon. It's everywhere. It's called Steel Wolves, and I'm in it. Now, it's the only film I'll ever be in. And I actually even got a nomination at one of the the freaking festivals for me. Wow, Because I'm the, I'm kind of, yeah, that was weird. She won. We won two best pictures, two best uh, directors. Okay. But the film I'm working on right now called The Womb, got to be the best thing I've ever done. Okay. And again, it started with no crew, but I did get some crew. I paid all the actors this time. Uh, it was during the pandemic. There's a lot of effects in this. Mm-hmm. There, and there's Constantine in this. There's a, there's a whole section in it where, you know, the people that know me from Constantine are going to see, well, oh, that's the same guy. So it's yeah. not a you know, comedy, it's drama, and it's really, really cool. And, and girls will cry at the end. Perfect. That's what I want. <laughs> we love making girls cry. So anyway, well, that's I, I'll probably cry world. as well. Okay. Well, well, we'll we'll make sure we uh, keep an eye out for the womb. I'm interested in going back and seeing Steel Wool, and uh, just want to say again, Frank, thank you for taking the time this morning to join us and uh, helping yeah. us celebrate Suburban Commando. We appreciate you, bud. Hey, thanks for liking something I've done. That's that's always great. <laughs> All right, Frank. Take care, brother. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. All right, guys, that was Frank Capello. Uh, man, that was awesome to get him on and uh, hear straight from the screenwriter. And uh, now I think a lot of what we've been talking about so far this episode makes a lot more sense. Um, so we, we thank Frank for coming on. All right, guys, it's time to get to awards. All right, so the first award up that we're going to give out is the Will Patton Award. The Will Patton Award being the person who had maybe not a huge part, but just absolutely was bringing the heat in the few scenes that they had. So for you guys, who was the person that was not in the movie much? So like Christopher Lloyd or Hulk Hogan wouldn't be eligible, right? With the that, secretary. The secretary. Killed it. Shelley Duvall. Yeah. Shelley Duvall. Okay, so that you, you would give it to Shelley Duvall. Absolutely. The secretary I thought was good too. How about you? I got to no. go with the secretary. The secretary. 
Okay. She's, she's back in heat. I mean, she's ready for business. She knows what she's in. She knows what she's interested in. I almost gave Purely the Will Patton award to, to the secretary I had, and then I changed it to Larry Miller. But uh, I'll, uh, if you guys want to go secretary, there seems to be a majority. I Since that was who I was thinking of, too, we can go. Uh, Bob, do me a favor and find out the name of the actress so we can formally give her the, uh, while, we're, while we're doing this, the Will Patton award. And uh, one of these times we'll have to explain the genesis of that. All right, top three performances. So, Clint, we'll start with you. Who do you think gave the top three performances in this movie? Uh, we do these backwards, right? I think I always do it wrong. But uh, three, we're going to go one. ahead. Uh, I, my best performance, yeah. I enjoy um, Christopher Lloyd, 100%. Yeah. Best performance in the movie. Yeah. Uh, the secretary, she did an awesome job. Again, she's not in it a ton. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, my favorite. I, I just enjoy the scenes with the mime, so it's going to be a combo mime Hulk Hogan, <laughs> that, that duo set there. It's just amazing to me. I'll get you out of there, buddy. <laughs> wow. So I just imdb the actress. This yeah. is very. This is actually pretty cool. Joanne Deering was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Hey, interesting. How about that? Yeah. Well, Joanne, you are the winner of the Will Patton Award for Suburban Commando. Mel, who you got for top three performances? Top three... <sighs> You know, Larry Miller. Yeah. I got I gotta throw him in there. Yeah. And then uh besides that, honestly, Christopher Lloyd. Yeah. Number two. Yeah. And uh the Hulk. The Hulk. Actually he surprised me. He could actually uh act a little bit in this. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, then again, wrestling's yeah. all acting too. Wrestling is mostly acting. All right, Bob, who you got for top three? I would say Lloyd, Hogan, and I don't know. I'm gonna stick with Shelley Duvall. So I would say with the three okay. main characters. Yeah, I had I had Christopher Lloyd number one. So I think probably between yeah. all of us, he kind of unanimously the highest, the highest ranking. ranking person in this movie. He was frozen in that um, movie. I was frozen today. Then I'm gonna go with Larry Miller again. Uh, thought he was fantastic, and I and I'll I'll do a tie for third place between Joanne the secretary, and and the cat that gets launched. Uh, oh, you did know. you? Quick side note, sorry, I know yeah. you're pressed for time, but did you know Elizabeth Moss was the little girl with the cat? Yeah, very, very young and early Elizabeth Moss in this movie. So that's that's the whole reason. She owes her success to Hulk Hogan and Frank Capello. That's I hope she realizes I don't, that. I don't think she'll feel that way at all. <laughs> Maybe not. <so. laughs> all right, guys, so we're going on now to top five quotes. So I'm going to give you guys what I ascertain to be the top five quotes in this movie, and then... If there's one that I missed that you thought should have been on there, let me know right afterwards. But at number five, I loved that little moment in the elevator where Hulk is like the only time he's vulnerable in the whole movie. And he, he turns to Charlie and says, you've got everything, Charlie, right? The family, you actually get to live on these planets. And I just kind of go from place to place and you've got everything. I thought that was really good. Uh, number four was when <laughs> this is almost like Christopher Lloyd calling out the writer uh, when Hulk's like, I've got something in my spaceship that'll track this thing down, and it's like a tracking device that will. Well, why didn't we use that in the first place? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> right? So good. That was number four. Uh, number three was the only line the Undertaker spoke in the entire movie. You're a dead man, Ramsey. Oh, <laughs> like so good. I see why you guys don't talk. <laughs> right? Oh, it was fantastic. And um, Christopher Lloyd has that speech in the bedroom. Um, and I don't remember the whole thing, but it was his, I was frozen today speech with, yes. with, with Shep. That was really like quintessential Christopher Lloyd. And then number one, of course, is, is Hulk's 10 minutes listening to your ice cream trucks in the level. This town <laughs> was number one for me. Do you guys have any that I didn't have on the list that you thought should have been on there? I think, uh, when Hulk goes through the, you know what we're going to do to you. And he goes through his whole, you know. Yeah. Pound, me, pound me into the ground, you yeah. know, speech there going on. No, this is the 90s. We're going to sue you. I think that was <laughs> definitely has to be, yeah. if not top five, it's in the 10. Yeah, that's that's a great, that's a classic one. Mel, Bob, any of the ones that I missed? Uh, I like the Colonel's uh, lose to win line. That's really good. Yeah, I like it. I just don't know what that means. That was my only thing. Like, what do you mean? How do you, how do you lose to win? Well, if they would have continued to fight and trying to win, they would have all died. So they gave up and lived. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess know. I don't That's know. That's a tough one. I'd have to go and watch that yeah. particular scene. All right, we'll put that one up there too. Then his jeep's got no wheels. Now, 
But I mean, think about his day. He's sitting out there with bourbon at like ten o'clock in the morning, <laughs> right? Full military regalia, multiple yeah. days in a row. I, what, I mean, that's yeah. that's not a bad retirement. And what's still his life there. like? He still has a clean front yard. He does. Somebody comes and mows it. He's not doing it. Absolutely. All right. So if they were going to remake Suburban Commando today, which wrestler would do just as poorly but still be watchable? Ronda Rousey. Ronda <laughs> Rousey. <laughs> okay. Who do you guys think? <laughs> What's wrestling? Because it couldn't be somebody that's good, right? So it can't be like The Rock or John Cena that are actually like decent actors that would, you know, make it too good. It's still got to kind of be bad. I would say Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns. I think that's that a, good, be a, that's that, a good call. I think he'd be no, a perfect choice. I think we got to get Goldberg back up in there. Bill Goldberg is another option. It'd be fantastic. Yeah. It'd be almost like a direct swap over. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be good. I think Bill's just a poor enough actor. <laughs> I mean, we all saw Universal Soldier return. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, All right, final question, guys, because, you know, we um, we ourselves are filmmakers, and we've made a lot of movies for very, very little money. So how would we be able to remake this movie for $1,000? You I, could I mean, just put a camera on the TV and press play. <laughs> we'll probably get it done in under $1,000. You think so? Including the camera. Well, we couldn't do the spaceships, so we'd have to have him like he travels to Earth in a different method, like in a fr- refrigerator or something. Microwave. A microwave. A refrigerator box. A refrigerator box. Yeah, that would work. Right? And we couldn't have Chris Lloyd's character play, like working in a big giant skyscraper, so he'd have to work like in an like accountant's office or something. What if he Shit. crash lands on a on a settlement and decides that he's gonna help a village full of blind African children? I, how are we going to make this in Burlington, <laughs> Wisconsin, Bob? I think that uh, shameless CGI. plug. CGI. Shameless plug, we use RC cars for the whole thing instead of real cars because that will definitely cut the cost down. So we would use we do like stop motion with action figures Absolutely. and put them on RC cars? Absolutely. Okay, we'll be blind, we can do this we with blind white children. Okay. <laughs> although although <laughs> let's be honest. Change. And a, still a plantation? Yeah. $1,000? <laughs> no, not a plantation. Probably a settlement. on this film. Settlement. <laughs> settlement. <laughs> settlement. A village. A village lost in time. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the show. You know, it'd be a big help to us if you guys could leave us a review wherever you found the podcast. Uh, Leave us a review. Those really help us. Also, make sure you follow and subscribe wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. And visit us on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash bad movies rule. We're posting content up there uh, on a weekly and sometimes a daily basis. And uh, we just really appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. And we will see you guys next time. Thank you very much.